From Classical WETA in Washington, we take you behind the music. In this episode, I'm speaking with renowned cello soloist Kian Soltani, who was in Washington earlier this year making his National Symphony Orchestra debut. He regularly collaborates with Daniel Barenboim, and still in his 20s, has played with some of the biggest orchestras around the world. He talks about how concert halls can change your tempo, his recent Deutsche Grammophon recording, and his experience with karate. Welcome, Keon. It's great to have you on Classical Breakdown. Pleasure to be here. There's so much to talk about with everything you're doing in music and your career so far. One thing I'm really interested in is your experience with the West Eastern Divan Orchestra, this group that's led by the legendary conductor Daniel Barenboim, and bringing together Israeli, Palestinian, and Arab musicians, bringing everyone together to play music. What, what was that experience like? It's really a eye-opening experience, really uh, life-changing in a way. Also, so I joined the orchestra five years ago already now, and I didn't know much, you know, about the whole thing. I obviously, for me, the attractive factor was Daniel Barenboim. I'm going to be completely honest here with you. I, I didn't know much about what is this orchestra really, but I knew who he is, of course. So I got drawn into it primarily because of him, but it became so much more than that. I was almost ashamed afterwards that uh, I didn't know enough about this whole subject and the whole idea of the orchestra. And it's really about the belief that in front of a musical score, we are all equal because the members who come to this orchestra, most of the times in their respective countries, they are not equal. Uh, Let's take, of course, the main example, Israel and Palestine and the conflict that is going on there. But when they come to the project with the orchestra, it does not matter anymore whether you are Israeli or Palestinian because we all have the same goal, which is to make the best possible musical performance. So we support each other in that way. So there is no more conflict uh, unless it's a musical conflict, maybe. Someone wants to play the phrase this way, someone wants to play it that way, but that's it's a very healthy dialogue that that starts that way. And of course, the notion also that we don't have to agree on everything. You do not have to agree on everything to be able to coexist. We always have this kind of tagline, which is agree to disagree. And that's that's actually a very important also discovery, that uh, the misunderstanding that you have to agree on everything just so we can coexist. No, it's the most important thing is the mutual respect and the acknowledgement of, of the other and to understand that the other has the same rights as you, whether you not agree on uh, little things or even the big things, absolutely doesn't matter as long as you respect the other side. So, um, I mean, lots of human things I learned from this orchestra. And on top of all of that, of obviously amazing musical experiences. And we all learned so much from yeah the big maestro, Barenboim. And I particularly was very, very lucky and fortunate that he then also started to work with me a lot outside the orchestra as a chamber music partner and also as a conductor uh, inviting me as a soloist. So I have really, really learned so much from this whole process and it's still going on. You went on tour with the orchestra playing Don Quixote um, by Strauss, which features a couple of musicians um, as soloists at that point. And playing the cello, you are Don Quixote himself, you know, the the huge hero of this. Uh, what's it like playing? Well, how many concerts was that in a row? Um, I counted. We did, a, we did a tour that almost spanned over two years. And in total, we played the piece over 20 times. Uh, which is incredible for especially for classical piece. I of course understand some pop stars go on tour and they, for them it's like a normal number, but for a classical musician to play a piece twenty times is is quite astounding. By the time we we were in the like last five six concerts, we were so into it. And Barnbum was conducting by heart. Obviously, I was playing by heart, and I felt like every musician on stage could have played by heart as well. Actually, we we knew the score inside out. It was a very privileged situation to be in. Playing it so many times, especially Don Quixote, that's not something that you would expect to play 20 times in a row compared to Beethoven's, you know, third symphony, yeah. um, which a lot of orchestras do on tour. So what is it, I imagine, like, you're playing completely differently in the last concert compared to the first, uh, maybe even in some of, like, uh, the interpretation of how you play the solo parts? 
yes, of course, things changed, yes. And also, uh, Maestro Barnbaum does things differently each concert. Really, it's completely unpredictable. Um, sometimes he takes a faster tempo, sometimes he takes a slower tempo. And uh, he always adapts, obviously, to the hall, first, first and foremost. He thinks he's convinced that a tempo is a is, is a very important choice, but it's the last choice that you have to make, and it always has to rely on many factors, and one of them be being definitely the hall. So I've seen him adapt very quickly to to halls and uh, what kind of sound feedback you get from that, and and then the tempo has to be adjusted according to that. So it makes no sense to have like a metronome marking it. Uh, it says 60 and okay, well, we have to play 60 now because the composer wrote it like that. Yeah, but don't forget in which circumstance the composer wrote it. He certainly didn't write it for uh, Carnegie Hall, let's say. Maybe, I mean, Strauss, of course, at, by that time, they already had, you know, co big concerts and stuff like that. But let's say Haydn, for example. I mean, it was written for a tiny little room probably in that in that castle and stuff like that. So you always have to adapt to to the surroundings and don't forget that uh, and also a good example Barnum also gave that once he was conducting a piece by Pierre Boulez which is one of the great composers of the 20th century and 21st uh, who has sadly passed away but was a great friend of Barnum and wrote some metronome marking in the score and Barnum took it way slower um, in the rehearsal and the concert and it just it was it was a tempo that felt right to him. And then he asked Boulez afterwards, "What did you think?" And he said, uh, "Perfect. That's exactly how it should sound." But he said, "Yeah, well, you know, you wrote it almost twice as fast." And I said, "Yeah, well, no, what you did is is better." And he asked him, "Why? Why do you think that is?" And Boulez said, "Yeah, when I write, I I write with water, but then when you play, you play with fire. So actually, it's it's a completely different thing. So you can never really take it literal until that moment when you actually." try out the piece in the hall that's when you have to make that decision finally so based on that there has been many many different versions of this piece over those two years every every time it was a bit different actually and it was very exciting for me also to follow that and sometimes lead that so if the hall is really boomy like with a lot of echo you might play it slower exactly so you can hear each other better if it's super dry um with everything absorbed you can play a lot faster exactly you need to push it forward a bit because the lines get lost they could get lost faster uh, and when it's boomy obviously the sound just mixes too much therefore you need to have more space between the notes all of these things need to be considered and also then uh, dress rehearsal on stage with no audience is again going to be different than a full concert hall in the evening so then also there's a big difference between dress rehearsal and concert also with him sometimes so it's always exciting is that something you do also now everywhere, like in a recital, you, you go to a room and, oh, this room's a little bit, it's it's more dry. I can play this section faster in a way that I'd like to. Of course, totally, yes. Um, faster sometimes, I don't push it so much faster sometimes because if, if, if a tempo feels right and is right, then even if in a dry room, it, it should feel and sound right. But to the slower side, definitely there's lots of room to explore there because... Uh, so what I always do, I, I record rehearsals, really. I record rehearsals and uh, listen back to them. And I see, and like, oh, on stage that sounded really great, but in the hall this needs much more time, actually, to, to really speak. And I need to play this passage much slower because actually notes get lost. On stage you can hear everything, but in the hall some things get lost. So you learn over time that uh, it's a different thing to play in a practice room. Uh, than to play for a hall. Things have to be pronounced differently. It's almost like a speaker that goes on stage and you have to overpronounce certain syllables and, and, and theater actors obviously are trained in that. And I feel like musicians are not necessarily trained in that so much. It's something you have to discover yourself over time. We're mostly trained to sound good in, in, a, ni in a nice small room, but we don't get lessons in a concert hall ever. When you go to a concert hall, you're usually already like, it's a day of the concert and uh, your teacher isn't there anymore, it's you're on your own. So that's something you have to experience over time and really teach yourself how to really speak on stage with your instrument. So have you actually maybe gotten in a fight with a conductor, like you do a rehearsal and you listen back to it and you say, you know what, that should be a little slower, and you say to the conductor, you know, I think we should play this, you know, maybe eight, ten beats slower. Have, they, have you ever had to do that? And maybe they say, no? No. Actually, <laughs> like, luckily, no. I, I will, they've never argued with me. They will always listen. And even if they have a different opinion than me, 
and they might disagree, but then I just do it anyway in the concert. <laughs> that's, that's the key. You can do whatever the conductor yeah, says in rehearsal, sure, and then the concert sure. happens. Whatever and, oh, they say. <laughs> it's, it's in the end, I play. <laughs> So you come from a family of musicians, mm-hmm. and but are they, being from Iran, are they classical musicians, you know, kind of like in the sense of Beethoven and Mozart, or they play different music? They were actually trained uh, classically, yes, Beethoven, Mozart, etc., and they studied in the Tehran Conservatory, and then they got a scholarship to come to Vienna. That's mid-70s now we're talking, 1976 or something like that. And they were trained, uh, they were, yeah, they were sent to Austria uh, on a scholarship and then they just stayed there. So they're fully classically trained musicians and they played in uh, some orchestras in Vienna, etc. And then they became music teachers. And now ever since my father is retired, uh, for example, he does a lot of Persian, he always did Persian music all of his life. But classical was always kind of more in the forefront and now he's focused uh, entirely on Persian traditional music and he's really good at it and I also learned that from him a bit and occasionally we also actually do play together and I try to put together some interesting program programs that kind of contrast this classical and Persian music and is really interesting for the listener most times. So was it kind of expected growing up that you'd be a musician? Being a musician was um, was a no-brainer I mean it was a basically, so I grew up and everyone around me was playing an instrument. So I just assumed as a little child that that's what everyone does. <laughs> like, I didn't know. I didn't know any other household. So I just assume every person in the world just plays an instrument. That's what we do, I guess. That's what we're, what we're here for. So I picked that one as well. And I, I started to play the cello. Only, only later did I realize that not everyone is a musician. <laughs> it was a big, <laughs> like, shock. And my whole world kind of worldview had to change. And uh, so it was clear that I was going to make music in some shape or form. It was it was like, like talking, like breathing. It was just part of our household. Was it clear that I was going to become a professional musician? No, of course not. Because we had a very playful approach to the whole thing anyway. They never put too much pressure on me. It was not like you have to become this, you have to become that. It was about you have to have fun with what you're doing. And if, if music is what you want to do and if it makes you happy, please... Uh, if not, by all means, anything else. And actually, I, there was many things I wanted to be when I was a child. I wanted to be a doctor. I I, I was very into sports as well, actually. At one point, I had to decide between uh, karate or um, music, and I chose music. I regret to this day, actually, that, that I stopped with karate. I feel like I could have done both, actually, if I really wanted to. But I guess I was scared. I wish I, I had not stopped it. It would be pretty cool to be a classical musician with a black belt, that were pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, I got to the green belt and then I stopped. I know a violinist actually, actually Stefan Milenkovic. He's a violinist who has a black belt, and uh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I've heard of a, like a bassoonist who also boxes. Oh, yeah. that seems dangerous with your lips. You know, oh boxing, yeah, it's you get true. It, the you lips. Get it in the head. That's that's true. The lips for a bassoonist would be dangerous. I was thinking that the hands are pretty safe because you're wrapped. Right. You know, you're pretty pretty safely wrapped. And also karate is not so dangerous for the hands because actually you're not supposed to hit anyone anyway. And a lot of it is also just um, single performance. It's more like a, a really art form, a performance thing where you're alone and uh, certain moves that have to be memorized. And then when it's a one-on-one combat, it's all about never actually touching the opponent. It's a minus point if you touch the opponent, if you actually hit him, if you actually hurt him, then you get points uh, deducted. So it's all about controlling that strength that you have and never actually hurting anyone. That's the whole philosophy of karate. And um, so it wouldn't have been so dangerous, actually. But time-wise, it would have probably been, been difficult to to really go through with both. But, yeah. It sounds like that whole thing with karate you're describing, going to the limit, going to the edge. You can't actually touch the person. That whole limit of, you know, finding in music, what is that limit of what you can do? Uh, it sounds like that there's a lot of trade-off there there is of course on music also there ha- you have to find the balance on stage of being completely immersed in in the music but never a hundred percent letting go completely because otherwise you lose control there's always has to be uh not detachment you have to be a hundred percent there but especially with very challenging pieces you cannot like just completely switch off your brain and just be a hundred percent emotional because i mean there is still a technical aspect to it and uh, 
you have to leave that last 10% for the listener to really experience it. And of course, there's moments you get 100% immersed and, and so on, but it's always a very, very dangerous edge. You should not fall over it uh, and keep the quality of the performance still on a high level. And yeah, it's, it's, it's rather similar. Classical Breakdown is made possible by Classical WETA. Join us for the music anytime, day or night. To listen live, just go to our website, classicalweta.org, or download our app. It's free in the App Store. Getting into your CD that you released last year mm-hmm. with Deutsche Grammophon, it's called Home. Yes. And it's got it's music of Schubert and Schumann, Reza Valli, is mm-hmm. that how you say his name, yeah. Reza Valli, and then also you. Mm-hmm. This is a pretty interesting CD. It's your first one, right? Yes. And it's called Home with All Those Things in it that you don't think that a record company would say yes to. You, know, <laughs> you think like they want your first CD to be um, – Schumann and Beethoven or something like that. But being able to have, it seems like you had a lot of control in that. Well, thanks Deutsche Grammophon for that, really. Yeah. I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for their trust, for their support, and their openness. And it's really, a, it's an incredibly, almost like unexpected um, relationship with them. Because, you know, obviously a Deutsche Grammophon approached me and I was like, oh my God, this this legendary old labels i was expecting some old guys are going to sit in the room like um really conservative and not even listening to my suggestions but just telling me what to do but then i enter and it's it's all young people like they're all young they're all so open they're all so creative and supportive all big smiles and they're just like do your thing as long as it's you all they want is um authenticity that's very important for them and a story so that's, that's the two things they told me. Be authentic and tell a story. Everything else is up to you. So, of course, there was a lot of brainstorming, a lot of uh, thinking, discussions. So what is authentic for me is obviously these composers, uh, Schubert, Schumann, because I grew up with them. Really, it's some of the first music I ever heard, I ever played, and I can really say it's something I feel like I have some sort of understanding by now. I have... Uh, Never, I'm not not done yet with this journey. Obviously, it's, it's lifelong to get to the bottom of these genius composers. But I have a certain maybe already approach to them after spending 20, 22 years of, of, you know, making this music. So I felt like I can be authentic with these composers. And, 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 and the beauty of it is also the story that this album tells. Obviously, this other side that I've already spoken about, my parents coming from Iran and this Persian culture that was always important for me, and the wish to create something new and not just, you know, rest on those uh, genius master works by Schubert and Schumann, but actually create something new, something that hasn't been done before and push things forward. And that's why I commissioned this piece by Reza Vali, which is a great Iranian composer, and he wrote these Persian folk songs specifically for me and specifically for the album. And I couldn't be happier with the result because it's a perfect blend of these Persian folk tunes that he took, but he completely made them his own and completely made something new out of it. So it was very important for me to to record something that hasn't been recorded before because it's important to make your own statement as well and, and, and just you know, to push things forward, to create new repertoire for hopefully other cellists that will want to play this piece, and, and they have. And as I know, many people have been interested now in this piece, and it's a great piece. And then as a little bonus, of course, at the end, I, I threw in that little encore that I wrote myself. It's nothing too serious, just a little challenge for myself to be creative, because that's something I, I, I always wish to be, and I don't want to become a stiff classical composer that just plays music that's 200, 300 years old, I always want to be creative as well and to create something that is mine. And so that was a challenge for me to do. And uh, I mean, the piece is, I, I had written years prior to that, but just to make that statement that, you know, I'm not afraid to be creative and put myself out out there. And I mean, of course, it's possible that you get criticized for it, but um, if you don't, if you're not getting criticized, yeah, you're, you're doing, doing something, something wrong. wrong. Exactly, yeah. that's the yeah. idea. If, yeah. if no one has any opinion on you, then, I mean, what's the point? <laughs> yeah. The title of it, Home, fits in with, with all of this, this um, Schubert and Schumann, which you kind of grew up with, and then this Persian music. It's all part of you and your home. Yes. 
uh, through the whole CD, it has a very singing quality, especially thinking Schubert and Schumann. Um, the lines, when you start listening to them, it's you, you could say, well, wait, is this for voice or is this for you know the cello? And some of them you have there, they are actual um, leader or art song mm-hmm. that you've um, put together for cello and piano. Uh, I want to listen to a little bit of this because I have some questions about kind of this singing quality. Here is that uh, the Schumann Myrten 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 <laughs> Du bist wie eine Blume Yeah, yeah. very well So listening to that, it sounds like you are singing through the instrument. Is that kind of the idea, singing through your instrument? Yeah, that was basically what I was going for. And, of course, it is a song for voice. So the goal is to imitate the human voice. And many people always say that the cello actually does resemble the human voice almost the most, of certainly of the stringed instruments. And... Actually, that's kind of a thing in most cello lessons. You always hear, uh, you know, take note of that singer. You know, how, how, would, how would you sing that? How would a singer do that? They say it all the time. And I've heard actually, funny enough, the opposite from singers. They come up to me and they say like in their lessons, the teachers always tell them, how would a cellist do that? How would a cellist play that? And imagine you were a cellist. So it's funny. There's this little kind of... Um, brother-sister relationship between the voice and the cello and I feel like that very much and as you said already the lines do blur on this CD quite on purpose because Schumann's music and Schubert's music I feel like are always somehow inspired by this singing quality and this elegance and then that we went from that to actually pure a pure song that was actually intended for voice and to see that similarity uh, was the whole idea and yeah, so I do try to to sing with my cello. But I guess kind of getting to the singing part in brass playing, um, kind of how you know I was taught, a lot of people are taught, is singing through your instrument and that being having the line so intensely sung in your head while you're playing so that you are dependent on that to create the music. I'm not, you're not thinking about, okay, I have to move my lips this way, I have to push down this valve. That's all just kind of automatic as long as you have this image this song already in your head i assume it's kind of the same for cello you don't want to be thinking okay put this finger down move the bow this way you want to have this line in your head and the ability to just let it flow you want to yeah that is the goal (laughs) let's say that is the goal but that is why we practice hours and hours and hours and hours uh for years and years and years and years (laughs) in our rooms and rooms and rooms so that we can go on stage and let go because that is the whole goal for me, especially especially in the last years. I've I've really made it my mission to to just be free on stage because I've I've been tired of uh, going on stage and focusing on all the wrong things. You really I really want to focus on having fun on stage and letting go of the technical aspect. And but for that you just need to practice so much that when the time comes you can completely forget about all your practice and just really have that line in your head and everything else should almost go automatic. Automatic is a bad word. I mean it in the best possible way by itself, naturally. And I'm getting there slowly. <laughs> well, it, I mean, it kind of saying automatic, I mean, the things could fall apart and with this kind of preparation, fall apart in terms of, I don't know, something terrible could happen around you and you can keep going. Your stand could blow over or something like that. You know, I've seen that. Um, but I think there's a lot of beautiful detail in this CD. And I think you're selling yourself a little short here when it comes to, you know, getting the line out. The Adagio and Allegro, at the very, very end, there's this, I forget what note it is, it's this long note right before the end. And so many musicians, and some people want to play it as just one note that has direction, but going from one place to the end. But when I listen to this, you hear it going somewhere, and then it sounds like it changes. Now listening to you, like to a different color or a different angle, and then taking off again. Um, 
And it's something that I don't think you hear a lot of. Well, maybe you know what I mean when I play this. And I love that. That's good. That's good. It's you always have to. I mean, that's good. I mean, not that my playing is good, but I'm saying your your remark that's is pretty good. good. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> um, your remark is very good, but I mean, not but. You always have to react also to what's happening around you and with around you I mean obviously since we're just two people on stage the pianist what the pianist does so that's what I was trying to do I think in that note in particular but throughout the whole piece because it's not just your part actually that's important most of the information you should not forget as a cellist most of the information is in the piano part you are just one line but the piano part has so many more so it's incredibly important to know exactly what the piano does and not to forget that Schumann composed obviously from the piano and he was a pianist so there's so much more information in the piano part than there is in the cello part. The cello part is just the cherry on top or like the tip of the iceberg, basically, but then 80% of it is right. underwater. And uh, so this note is just one note, but what the piano does is very important. This whole arpeggio going up, first of all, and then it goes down again. That's why I went down, but then actually it does lead to the next bar in the last moments. Uh, so that that whole thing, I, I just went with the piano, basically, what the pianist did so well, who, by the way, should definitely be mentioned, yes. uh, Aaron Pilsan, who is a kind of childhood friend, and we basically grew up together, and is he's from the same area in Austria, therefore even more connection with home, and we even recorded it right there when we were where we were both born. I mean, not right in the hospital, but we no. recorded it in the nearest <laughs> concert hall. <laughs> We got to listen to some of the Persian folk songs. This is in memory of a lost beloved. Now, did you have any direction with um, having him write this stuff? Did you say? I want these ideas as folk songs or there were folk songs that he chose or how well, was that? I just wrote him that I would like him to write a piece for me and I would love him to make it about our Persian origins. That's what I told him. And then I thought maybe we will have a dialogue about it and stuff like that. I didn't hear back from him for a couple of months and I thought, oh, maybe he's not even interested. And then he wrote me a couple of months later here's the score I finished it <laughs> <laughs> nice here you go and I was like wow alright that's it I guess and I opened it and I played it and I was like that's it I mean nothing to be said or to be done and so no I was not involved at all in the compose composing process which is good I mean not it's absolutely unnecessary for me to, to be involved and uh, he did such a great job so the whole the only thing I told him was please you know make it about our Persian roots, and he did so beautifully. It's it's absolutely beautiful. I want to play a little bit of this. It's called the Persian Fire Dance. This this encore he made. There's so many fun things in this. <laughs> How do you get that sound when it gets? It's kind of playing close to the bridge, like. Ponticello, it's the, the technical term for it. You play with the bow very close to the bridge and then it gets this <laughs> scratchy sound. Like the, bri the, the bridge is that part where right where the strings kind of make contact towards exactly. the bottom it's, of the instrument. It's the yeah. last place you can still play on the cello before you before it stops, basically. Yeah, Yeah, that's it's so much fun. The whole story that's here from the, the Schubert down to this um, Persian fire dance. There's a question I like to ask everyone. And if you don't want to answer or if you don't have an answer that's fine but I, I want to know what is the funniest or most unexpected thing that's happened to you like in music like on stage well obviously um, strings break occasionally that's happened but for me it was more stressful that happened recently actually not so funny actually now that I think about it but I started the Beethoven Sonata and I was in the towards the end of the first movement let's say like a minute left, and then my A and D string completely, no, no, my D and G string, which is the second and, and third string. Obviously the cello has four strings, and it was the second and third string of the instrument completely went down, like f full tone. I don't know why, it's just like, like down. <laughs> and I was, it was with radio recording. Oh. I kid you not. And so 
I really had a split second to decide do I stop now, which would have not been smart. I had to continue. I had to go go on, but I had to somehow adjust with my fingers to that. And in my mind, I was like, this is not happening right now. This is one of those dreams that you wake up and you're so happy it was just a dream. You know, yeah. we all have those. And I, was, I kept waiting to wake up, but it didn't happen. So I had to go to the end of this movement with somehow playing everything like a note higher on the second and third string, but normal on the first string. And uh, crazy enough, some most people didn't notice. Some musicians obviously did notice. Some the cellists in the audience they noticed because they heard the strings go down. Actually, yeah. Uh, but most people didn't notice. Uh, but then, of course, I, I told the radio people to please not <laughs> include that in the broadcast. But that was not funny at all. It was extremely stressful. But that's something that happened recently. Yeah, it'll be funny in uh, in a couple of years. In, in a couple of I'm years. already laughing now. Actually, yeah. <laughs> well, that's. I mean, that's incredible. I don't think people realize it's not just, oh, I put my finger a little bit higher here and then that comes out. You have, especially with uh, strings, whole kind of, I don't know what if you call them sequences or but just automatic way or, you yeah, know, fingerings, fingerings, automatic ways that it just gets played. Yeah. And um, that's amazing. You I, you got through it. I, I did. I did get through it. Yeah. yeah. And I'm stronger for it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Keon, for coming on the podcast. It's been great. Any final thoughts? Uh, no. Uh, much uh, love and peace and happiness to, to everyone. <laughs> All right. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown. For more information on Keon Soltani, visit the show notes page at classicalbreakdown.org. You can also send us an email at classicalbreakdown at weta.org. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe and leave a review in your podcast app. I'm John Banther. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown from Classical WETA. Classical Breakdown.